testing. Can you hear me anyway? Okay. Okay, no problem. Second. Testing. Good. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start anyway because I'm a black preacher and my introductions are really long. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to, so. So, um, again, this is always a blessing. The last time I was here is, uh, was January 19th. I, I remember that because I went home and for a week and a half I was in bed sick. So I've been trying to convince my wife that I already had uh, COVID-19 and I have all the antibodies, but she's not buying it. Um, but uh, it was a blessing to be here. It always is a blessing uh, since Pastor Andy's been here and Janice, they've been um, gracious to have me uh, share about the point and uh, talk about what God is doing there and then bring a word. Um, and just to give a quick update of the point, because you, your church has been so supportive of us. As a church and as individual members, um, you've, you've given, you've supported us financially, you pray. Uh, a group several years ago uh, fixed up a, the boxing gym for us and got that all going, that ministry. And so we owe a great deal of thank you and, and appreciation. But I want to share a little bit of how things have changed. Of course, as you can imagine, a community center that every night has about 50 to 80 kids uh, and volunteers and staff is a place that when COVID-19 hits, it becomes a desert. You can't have that going on. Um, however, because we work with um, lower income students, right away staff, Nancy's our program director, Sanjay is our outreach director. Uh, we knew that we had to do something because many of the kids attended the point, relied on the dinner that we would provide. And then in summer, we would provide lunch, a snack and dinner. Um, and so majority of our students, over 90%, would receive free or reduced lunch. And so for schools to shut abruptly um, because of COVID-19, that need will not, would not be met. So as a staff, we got together to try to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this? There's a food bank that we were going to get emergency boxes, and we said we'll just deliver it and drop it off to the students. At the same time, uh, the new superintendent of the school called and said, would you partner with us in distributing the food that they would have had, the breakfast and lunch? And so from March all the way to June, we worked with the school. Um, we became a hub site where people can pick food up. And then we would go into certain communities that was hard to, to reach and distributed 7,000 meals a week uh, to students. Um, and it, it just shows how, in many ways, what was started in 2003, um, God was preparing us for such a time as this, um, to be a community center, even the way we set up and operate in a, a crisis like this, we're able to mobilize quickly. Well, after the school, when school was technically closed in June, they stopped distributing. And so we had to change um, uh, and start to figure out how do we continue to help those families. Um, Nancy being our program director and having experience in the past where they did outreaches, um, uh, bus ministries uh, um, decided, hey, why don't we just go into the communities with groceries and uh, deliver food to families enough for a week and also pray with them and share Christ with the kids. And so technically, Real, not technically, we just never stopped from the days the doors uh, closed because of COVID. We kept operating even to now. We're now preparing to reopen to students where we're going to address the issues of uh, remote learning. And so if you can imagine for an average student that we work with, there's not, uh, they may not be internet access. And if there is, certainly not enough for multiple students to get online together, especially in close quarters and um, the homes may be loud and there's younger brothers and sisters in there. So it was a tough call, but we've decided that we're gonna operate, we're gonna open at 7.15 every morning. And so students can come all through the day and get help, not get help, actually be able to do their remote learning during their lunchtime, we will be doing uh, uh, activities, and before they leave, we'll do our, our gospel presentation. So we're trying to take what we do, scale it down, be flexible, and continue to address specific needs of the community. All of that is only possible because we have such support uh, from churches, uh, from individuals, even churches as far as Princeton, New Jersey, that uh, ensure that the funding is there. As you can imagine, nonprofits right now are struggling. 
uh, because um, there's such uncertainty. People, rightfully so, are thinking about how can I ensure that I'm not going to just go broke in the next few months or who knows how long this is going to end. Um, but we've been fortunate. We've, uh, we've received funding throughout this, and we're going to continue to work with the community. Keep praying for us that we will be effective uh, as we do so. At the end of the day, we certainly want to help kids academically, um, but they need to know who Jesus is, and they know, need to know he's king. Their lives are going to change drastically. Um, sometimes there is no going back to normal, um, but this is the same type of environment Jesus came to, and his solution was himself. Right? And so we can't negate that aspect as we, as we try to address those other needs. So continue to pray with us and support us as God leads you so that we can bless these kids. As I begin to look at what's happening and, and uh, I'm meeting with uh, families and kids, even police, my wife will tell you, um, the riots that we're seeing and the um, accusations and sometimes evidence of police brutality it's not just something that's affecting the black community or, or, or people that are poor. Um, the very officers who are uh, dedicated to protecting the community, they too are struggling um, because their profession mean a lot to them. And uh, as they see some of the abuses, they want to make clear that that's not them. And I had an officer, he must have, he's like about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, one of the biggest guys you can ever meet, um, asked if he can, can, if he can meet with me. And he says, it's breaking his heart. He wants to be a part of the solution, not one part of the, the problem. And he's weeping and weeping. The police chief of our community um, reached out also, and so many others. Um, this is a tough time for everyone. Same time uh, when the riots broke out in, in, uh, in Philadelphia, there were was some riots, not as big as other places, but there were protests. Um, we got a text from a young man who's part of the National Guard who was a, uh, a staff, uh, a student at the point, um, and he said, they're calling me up. Uh, what, do, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, you can't act. I don't know what you're supposed to do. But he was so afraid. And we know this young man, he's never got into a fight. He's never broken up a fight, but now he's being called to stand between the police and riders. And there's fear. And at the same time, we had some students that went into the protest and others who we're glorifying the riots. There's a lot of fear right now in our nation. We have young kids who are depressed. They have been out of school. They couldn't leave. There's not much to do. They already had it tough anyway. The point was a place that kids who cannot afford a YMCA or a gym membership or any of that, they can come. That's been taken away from them. It's not like they have options. And so we started at first doing online uh, conversations using Zoom, and that died real quick. Because you can see those kids as they're trying to, they can't even communicate. They can't talk. They're trying to process what's happening. One young lady says, all I do is stay in my room all day. And recently we got a report from a sister of a young girl. She says, all she does is just stay in her bed. No one knows what's going on. So depression and, and there's fear. There's a lot of parents who are worried because, will, they, will their jobs ever come back? Right? And some of us um, who might be uh, better off, we know that at any moment we can lose everything. Um, the economy can take a dive. Some of our investments can bottom out. And so we're in a, we're in a time in our history, uh, we say it's unprecedented, but it's, uh, it's scary. So what I want to share a little bit is, is fear and faith, and really faith over fear in this time moving forward. Because it's my belief that fear leads to idolatry. Because when you're afraid, you're seeking security. And sometimes we don't think God can come through. And we begin to put a lot of our focus on, on the things of the world, believing that it will take us through these difficult times. And if we don't, if we don't have faith, fear was, would grip us. And be, before you know it, the church, the body of Christ, will be steeped in idolatry like generations in the past. And a good example to find this relationship between faith and fear is actually in the book of Judges and, and in particular chapter 6, the story of Gideon. Now, we know the story of Gideon. I mean, we've all studied it. We all enjoy it. It's usually preached in, in this, this sense. Gideon is a, uh, a, a, an unlikely candidate to be used by God. And, you know, when, especially when we teach the story of Gideon to kids, we talk about how no matter who you are, you might be weak, you might be scared, but God can make a warrior out of you. 
And then we emphasize in that story the fact that Gideon was supposed to go to war. He amasses this huge army and God windles it down to about 300 to take on this huge uh, uh, army of, of enemies. And he was able to defeat them. And many times that's the story for us. How God can allow you to defeat the enemy if you just have enough faith. Well, I think the real emphasis of the, st of the story of Gideon is when he had to defeat the idol that his father had in his backyard. At the end of the day, that's probably the most difficult fight any of our children would ever have to take part in. Not the enemy outside, but the idols that we, the parents, create for them. And often the idols we create for them is the idols that come out of our own fears. And as we um, talk with our kids, or even as they overhear our conversations at home, they're hearing what we really prioritize. They're, really, they're hearing what we're really afraid of, what we're really consumed with. And as they get older, that becomes the idols that are so powerful in them. My fear is that we need a, a generation to be lifted up, to serve Jesus in this world. And if they're going to do so, we have to make sure those idols aren't there in their lives. It might be the fact that judgment on our generation is that we created too many obstacles for our children to truly be used by God because of the idols that we formed in them. But this is not an attack at all. It is not a judgment. It is my fear. Of all the next few months, we have elections coming up. We have some people saying COVID will be worse in the fall and the winter. I'm afraid. What if I lose everything? What if... I can't afford the lifestyle that I, I, I find most comfortable. What am I going to rely in? What am I going to trust in? We often say we want to go back to normal, but what if normal is where our idols are? So let's look at the story of Gideon as I just want to uh, build the case of what's happening, the context of what's happening, right? So the background of the story, it's a time of moral decline. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1 says this. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. I think that's something that we can all identify with, that there's a sense that out there, there's this deep immorality, and it's gripping us. We're afraid of it. What is happening in our nation? You know what I find to be the most difficult thing? is to sit down with my family and watch a television show. Because even the ones that are supposed to be family friendly, there's so much immorality in it. And I'm talking about the Disney Channel. Some of the stuff that's presented as family friendly and how it's the subtle lies and the subtle sin is presented is scary. But that's just... We could always shut the TV off. A lot of us were, in a way, happy that schools were shutting down because we were worried about the indoctrination that our children are receiving. And then the music. Music is supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be reflecting truth. You put some of the, I can't say CDs because I don't think anyone uses CDs anymore. But you play some of the songs and you're gripped with how vile people can get. But let's be honest. That's not where we see morality. It's in our White House. It's in our Senate. It's in D.C. It's in our churches. It's in our businesses. It's on our stock market. You want to see sin? Look at the heights of our society. Where we claim civilization and greatness. That's what grips me most. Because when we seek something pure, we can't find it. And so we're left saying, well, you have to choose the better of two evils. Last time I checked, the better of two evils is evil. And that's where we're at. It's not condemning anyone's vote, but it's to, to let us know, hey, we're real, where are we really? When a society comes to a place where you have to choose the better of two evil, you, you realize your society is almost done. It's almost over. Because we live in a time of moral 
decadence and decline. It, all, it was also a time of military defeat. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. So Israel, that's supposed to be God's people, supposed to be God's nation. God makes a covenant with him, with them. And even in the covenant, he says, listen, I'm going to fight your battles for you. You don't even have to worry about that. I just need you to be obedient to the promise that you will be the light to the Gentiles. And they couldn't even do that. And so everywhere they turned, they were in f- fear of the enemies. And isn't that us right now? I could never justify riots. I could never justify anyone going into a community and breaking windows and stealing and looting. But you know what's crazy? Even though that's limited to a few cities, we're all afraid that it will happen in our communities. I live in a suburb. I live in a development. But you can ask my wife. I'm telling her, wait, what happens if they come through our neighborhood? What am I going to do? And the same thing when ha- with the terrorism in 9-11. Remember, it happened in New York City, but you could be living in a rural community and you think it's going to happen to you. It's a defeat. We're defeated because of the fear that grips us. And don't forget our fear of Iran and North Korea and Russia and all of that. It's a time of economic disaster. Verses four through six. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was bought, brought very low because of Midian. Now, some of us are, are, are blessed that up to this point, our lives are recession-proof. Our lives are depression-proof. Our lives are pandemic-proof. But you could only be that strong for a while. And what happens if it continues? What happens after so much stimulus spending that you can't spend no more? What happens if you rely on grants? from the government to do your job and they say we can't spend this way you know as strong economically as this country is it can go away just like that and this was Israel part of God's promise to them is you're my people you will always have abundance but because of their disobedience they were in need and in fear verses 7 through 10 It was a time of emotional distress. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. We need prophets today, don't we? We need prophets. They tell the truth. They step on our toes. They make us uneasy, and we often kill them, but we need prophets. In the midst of all of this, God sends a prophet. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Interesting. God sums it up as there's a fear of the gods of the Amorites. I thought it was just the Amorites and the Midianites. But there was something behind that. They were fearing these idols. You know, I heard this statement a long time ago. If you can't beat them, you... Is that where idolatry is rooted? When we can't defeat them and God has given us the power as the church to defeat them. 
that oftentimes we join them by just creating in our lives these idols. What's God's answer to this? How does he address this? Contextually, he addresses it with Gideon. And this is where we often preach the, the, the message. We talk about this, this unlikely candidate to be used by God because it makes us feel good that he can use just about anyone. That is true. It says, now the angel of the Lord came. Now look at this. In the midst of all this pain and suffering and challenges, he sends a prophet, then he sends the angel of the Lord. We need miracles today, people. We need him. This is going to get more difficult. This nation right now is, is toying with civil war. It is. The church is compromised. We're struggling with how can we be good patriots and good Christians at the same time. And which one really gets our allegiance? This is not, this potentially can get real ugly. We need prophets and we need miracles. We need visions. It's interesting. I don't know how much of you buy into this, but the more I read, I read of Muslims all around the world who are having visions of Jesus and coming to faith in him. And I'm asking questions, well, why are the Muslims seeing Jesus and we're not? Now, of course, we can say because they lack the church, they lack the witness, the Lord Jesus is presenting himself to them so that they can come to faith. I know that, but I want to see him too. What is he saying to us that we don't have those stories? Now, the angel of the Lord came and said under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, uh, before I, I was a bad reader when I started reading the Bible, I was struggling academically and I thought it was Oprah. And I was like, ain't that interesting? Oprah Winfrey's in the Bible, right? Is that? Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizirite. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Fear. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. A few things real quick. One, um, see, I'm from, I grew up in New York City, so I don't know what a wine press is. I thought wine came from the store, right? I didn't know there was a, <laughs> right? And, 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 um, and he was, what, he said he was um, beating wheat in the wine press, which from what I read, it meant that he was hiding from the enemy and hiding the wheat from the enemy. And this is an example of his fear. But the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you. Oh, mighty man of valor. So that was, that was God's unexpected answer. But look at Gideon's unexpected response. Verses 13 through 16. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian? Real quick. I used to look at this and say, man, he had little faith. And he, and he was a terrible person because he's questioning God. But what I realized, he was actually questioning the God of his fathers. Because they weren't consistent. The reason why he's having trouble believing in God is because look at what we're in and y'all keep telling me about him. You guys keep telling me about this Jesus, but I look around at a mess. And the mess is in the church. You know, sometimes our children need to resist. They need to doubt and question. Because they're not questioning and doubting Jesus. They're questioning and doubting us. And the, the, the lies or the false claims we've made because we have not been consistent with that truth. But look at this. So he's, he's mad. I can imagine. Like, what, what about the Lord? Where is he at? He hasn't shown up in anything. Remember, it was the angel of the Lord speaking to him. And then it says this. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. It's almost as if God sent the angel. Now, we know it was a Christophany. It is Christ in the Old Testament of Theophany. But I like how it's, how it's worded. The angel comes and says, hey, mighty man of God. And then he gets mad 
And then it's as if the Lord turned around and said, oh, my goodness. I like what I'm hearing. Go in this might of yours. It went from the angel of the Lord to the Lord saying, this is what I need. I need someone that's fed up with that old religion that's forgotten me. I need someone that's willing to call the religious people out and saying, where's this God you talk about? We really need to start listening to the children more. And when they question us, maybe it's for a good cause. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in, the midst, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of the Midian. Do, not, do I not send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Now, I, I want to conclude this. It's going to take another 10 minutes, so I'm sorry if I'm going over. We know this part of the story. It's in all of our children's books. And we then jump to the part where he def defeats the Midianites. And we tell our children, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But the real substance of this story is found actually in verses 25 through 32. So finally, you know, we know that he puts out the, the um, what is it called? The, the fleece. We know that stuff. We tell our kids, I tried it once, right? Um, and that was important, right? He tested God. He said, God, show me that you can. And God showed up. And we keep telling our children, don't. You know, sometimes God accepts that. Like, he, he's not as angry as we think he is. I remember when I was in college, and I couldn't pay for college. And I was in Bible college. Year after year, I would have to go back a month or more after school started because I had to try to get enough money to pay my balance off. And every time I would go, I would always go from an A to a B or a C because if, if you miss enough classes, they just degrade you a whole grade. So I start off as a C, right? And it got a lot, it got very frustrating. So in my junior year, I worked all summer in New York City to save up and I got a note from my school, Bible college. And they said, hey, um, you have a $1,500 debt and you cannot come back to school until you pay that off. And I wrote them back and I said, I, I, I will be paying by faith. And they said, no, we don't take faith. We take Visa and MasterCard and checks. But it was very frustrating to me. And I had saved up a little, but I didn't have enough. And so, uh, and to show you the power of God and why we need to do some of the simple things we used to do. Uh, I'm walking down 125th Street in Manhattan. And there's this truck with a whole bunch of Christian writings all over it. And it was some uh, kids younger than me. You know how we send our kids out to do mission and all that stuff. And sometimes we think it's just a short vacation. No, God uses them. This is a little girl, right? She walks up to me and she says, do you have a prayer need, a prayer concern? And I said, yeah, I do. But I looked at her list and it was like, you know, one, two, three. It was like the 60, right? I'm like, I'm not even going to ask that prayer because God is never going to get all the way down to 60. Right. By the time he gets down, he gets tired. He's like, you know. So she she then takes the pen and she puts it above number one. And it's like, praise the Lord. My prayer is going to be answered first. <laughs> but this was my prayer. I said, I need fifteen hundred dollars by Monday because that's when school started. And I said, but I want God to do it in a way that I know it's him. I'm not going to ask my, my grandfather. He would have done it. And he didn't have much, but he would have tried because he's my grandfather. I'm not going to ask my church because they themselves might feel compelled and take a collection and do it. But I would not have known for sure if God really wants me to commit to ministry. Because it wasn't working out the way I thought it should. And so that was my, she wrote it down, right? And this, as God is my witness, this is exactly what happened. That Sunday, I went to church late. And I sat in the back pew, me and my friend Angelo. And when the service ended, I got up to leave. And this lady that was sitting right in front of us turned and said, which one of you need money for school? God still speaks to his people. And so here's one of the, here's one of the things. It kind of sounds mean. But sometimes you need to be around people who are messing around, not doing the right thing. Angelo and I were both in college, but he had just dropped out. 
So he didn't need the money, right? So she, so I looked at, he looked at her and says, no, I don't need it. And I said, I need it. She said, how much do you need? I said, $1,500. Remember the prayer, God do it in such a way that I know it's you. Next morning, she comes to my house in Queens and she gives me a check for $3,500. All right. So, you know me, I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And God did above and beyond even what I asked. That wasn't a miracle. I jump in the car and I drive to school. I go to the business office. Here's the money. He says, you have a $2,000 balance. What are you going to do with that? I said, I'm not sure yet. Now, wisdom would have said, just apply it to next year. But I was thinking about the PlayStations and the Nikes and all that stuff, right? I said, man, I'm going to look good this school year, right? And uh, I walk out. So the Lord is my witness. I walk out and my friend, Tia, was walking in. She's today married to one of my best buddies. Joel Gaines. She's walking in in tears. What's wrong? She says, I have to um, drop out. I said, why? She said, because I owe $2,000. So I told her, man, I'm sorry to hear that. And I left, right? No, 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 no. I went back in and I told them, hey, can you apply that to her account? Man, we need these miracles to keep us going. And we need to pray like that. So let me get to it. I know I'm going long. I'm sorry. So what's this story all about? Is it about Gideon defeating 300? When you read the, uh, defeating the uh, Midianites, when you read the story, he didn't do anything. God did it all. And God could have done it all. The story was really about idolatry and the obstacle it creates for God using his people. So look at this real quick. The night the Lord said to him, that night the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has. And cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold. Here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. Look at this. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asher besides it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah besides it. But Joash said, Joash, remember this is his house. This is his idol. And he said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal? He's now defending his son. And if I was the people, I'd say, dude, that was your bail. But you see how God's people can be both. They can have this faith. They can have this understanding and this assurance of their faith, but they can still have idols in their lives. And as absurd as it is, look at him. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by the morning. Dude, this is your idol. You put him up. You contaminated the community. He said, now this is where he's now getting really religious. He said, if he is a God, referring to Baal, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Let him fight. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbaal. I can't even pronounce that. Jerubel. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down his altar. I have a few points and I'm going to end here. We need faith over fear. If we are going to contend with what's coming, if we're going to be resistant to the temptation of idolatry, we need faith. 
One, faith over fear does not mean lack of fear. You'll be, you'll be afraid. Gideon was. He said he was afraid. He did it at night. But it means it confronts fear. It's not that you're not going to be afraid that you lose everything. But you can confront it. Yeah, we might lose that house. Or, or look at this. How many of us, our kids have been working so hard academically? And right now, the way they're doing school, they're probably going to fall behind. Let them confront that. Because you're going to be okay if you trust God. Some of our kids play sports. And they want a D1 scholarship. That's their college. That's how they're going to get into college. That's how they're going to afford college. And you're going to have a whole year of students that's going to miss out on that. But if we give in to fear, we're telling them that was everything. And there's no way around it. You might as well give up. We're going to be afraid. But faith means we're going to confront it. Point two. Faith over fear sometimes must confront our family idols. We have them. I have them. My family was poor. So they always talked about money, but always as we don't have enough. Hey, can I? Nope, we don't have enough. Something as simple as going to the store and they tell you before you walk in the store, don't ask for nothing because you ain't getting nothing. But what that begins, that, that focus on lack of money creates in the child that focus on the need for money. Money isn't a bad thing, but it can become an ultimate thing. And so that's how my conversation is with my kids sometimes. We can't afford it. And it might be true or it might just be I'm being frugal. But if I don't teach them about the provisions of God and how he'll take care of us, if I only focus on what money, what I, what lack of money can't do, that they're going to focus on what money can do. And for some people, money can do everything. And if to you, money can do anything, you will do everything for money. How many lives have been destroyed in that pursuit? So the idol of money says this. I have a certain level of wealth, financial freedom of nice possessions. That if I lose it, I lose the will to live. Money is not the problem. The Bible says the love of money. Idolatry isn't bad things. Idolatry is good things that become ultimate things. And when something becomes an ultimate thing, this is our conversation with ourselves. If I lose this thing, I lose the will to live. Some of us have been there where something has been taken away from us that we almost said, I just want to die. That's when you know it was an idol. Faith over fear sometimes must confront family idols. There's an idol of money. There's an idol of success, which says, I'm highly productive and getting a lot done. I'm, I'm successful and I have to be successful. What if success is taken from you? What if you just got that promotion, but because of restructuring and because of what's happening, you're brought back down and you're like, oh, what are you talking about? And, and what's worse with the success idol is that sometimes we judge our children based on that. Or our children perceive that the love you have for them is based on their level of success. And we tell ourselves, well, I'm only doing it because I care about you and I want you to do better than me. And we live in the time of the most mental health in the history of this country. We have sacrificed our children on the altar of success. They're not free. It's not to say that you don't have high standards for them. But remember, they're supposed to be used by God. And if we put these obstacles in front of them, these idols, then it's going to be more difficult for them to be used by God. I know I'm going long. I'm sorry. Faith over fear sometimes must confront the family idol of security. Which says, I have everything I need and people are dependent on me. I don't need nobody. That could be an idol. And then you have children that develop themselves to be just that. You know, they said that they tell us the Protestant ethic and um, that work ethic and that rugged individualism is a good thing because it helped America become great. That rugged individualism is what will destroy America. And it makes sense because guess what? The idols that we have always destroy us. And we got to be very careful. 
That's not rugged individualism for the sake of rugged individualism. It's responsibility so that you can be a blessing to all. And sometimes we forget that God has something to say about even the things that our society deem as value and virtue. You got to be careful. Faith over fear sometimes must confront the idols of our community. Look at what happened. It's in his backyard. But then it's the people from the community that had the biggest problem. In other words, his home became the, the spot for idol worship. And the community was upset. They didn't like this change. And sometimes God is calling us to confront what our community likes. That's when we are really quiet, aren't we? We don't want to step on toes. We don't want to offend anyone. Quickly, there's an idol called social cohesion where it says this. Don't rock the boat. Unity is more important than truth. I don't like to see the protests. Can't they do it a different way? Now, I'm not talking about the riots. That's always wrong. But sometimes we want peace so much that we'll excuse evil as long as there's no rocking of the boats. We need more rocking of the boats. Because maybe we're all on the wrong boat. Faith over fear sometimes must confront community idols of tradition. Well, this is just how we always did it. I'm not concerned about how we always did it. I'm concerned about what Jesus is doing. And these people came and say, yo, where's Joe Ash's son? We got to kill him because this is what we've always been doing. Worshiping in your backyard and you just messed it all up for us. Faith over fear sometimes confront the community idol of religion. We've made our religion an idol. Christianity is just the name of those who submit to Jesus and follow him. But we've made a big religion out of it. And when people start pushing back by uh, uh, the religion, we get offended. And the reason why is because that religion makes, means more to us than Jesus. We've got to be very careful that we're not defending a religion that has a lot of black eyes. The history of Christianity has been ugly in many ways. God's people have messed it up for a lot of people. Jesus didn't. Stop defending the indefensible. Preach Christ. Four, and I'm done. I know it's been long. Faith over fear sometimes confront cultural idols. Faith over fear confronts nationalism. Because that can be an idol. My national identity is ascendant and recognized as superior. Have, love your nation. I'm from Guyana, small country. I love my country. But I love Jesus more and his will. And I'll be the first to condemn what my country has done to its own people. And say that God has a greater purpose. Jesus does have a vision for every nation. He does. And in order for the nation to actually come to that vision, he says, go make disciples of the nations. That's our responsibility. And we got to fight for it if we truly love it. America is, and we've always said it, people said it, like America is not going to be destroyed by someone from the outside. It'll be destroyed, for, be destroyed by people on the inside. And we're seeing it, and the church is taking up sides. If ever the church needs to learn how to intercede in prayer, it's now because America is not going to be saved because it's the greatest nation ever. It can't. It's only going to be saved because of the remnant of Christians that are praying and seeking God and leading the country in repentance. We're impressed with the Constitution. Jesus isn't. He has his own Constitution. He has a kingdom. He's already said, all these kingdoms are going to be mine. So if we're not on the front line praying and fighting for God's mercy... We're going to be answering for the failure of this nation. It was never up to them whether or not they were sustained themselves. It was up to the salt and light to do that. That's us. I'm going to have to end here. What's the point? God said, Gideon, before you go fight for me, fight the idol in your dad's home. And that was the biggest idol and the biggest challenge Gideon ever had. Some of us are getting up there. Do we have another 10, 15, 20 years? Some of us don't want to have another 10, 15, 20 years. 
come Lord Jesus, come. I'm always yelling at Sanjay because he'll eat unhealthy. And he says, well, if I die, I get to go to heaven. I just want to go now. I said, Sanjay, no. He has a purpose for your life. But the reality is some of us are actually the only hope we have is our children and grandchildren. Right? And what if we have created the greatest obstacles for them to actually be used by God? Because before they can go on the battlefield of making disciples, they got to battle all these idols that we've put in them. I'm as guilty as anyone else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for how painful it is. Lord, I, I want to see more Gideons rise up, but I'm probably the reason why they can't. My life, the things I preoccupy myself with, the things I prioritize, often can lead to my own idolatry, but the idolatry of my children. They can start worshiping the things that I uh, am always talking about. And I want them to be missionaries, and I want them to serve you, but they might be battling some of these idols for years before you can get the best out of them. Lord, teach me how to truly repent. Teach me how to go back in the backyard and destroy it before my kids have to. And show them what obedience looks like. Lord, this time in our nation is tough, and it might get worse. Help us to be there for one another as a church and help us to rely on you. And we do pray, God, we need the miracles again, Jesus. We need you to show up. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, dear brother. I'm wondering what's in my backyard. I better take a look this afternoon, huh? It's a fake song. It's a fake song. Thank you so much. You've all been great. I trust uh, that you'll keep all of us in prayer. As kids go back to school, I was asked to make one announcement on the back table. You'll see giving records that should have uh, did come out uh, in June, but uh, mid year. Uh, pray for for everybody involved. Churches particularly are hurt right now. Nonprofits are hurt, and uh, God leads you to uh, take a look at the point if there's ever uh, a worthy. Yes, it would go to that. God bless you in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is not just a benediction, but may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all as we continue. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming today. i